Hello and welcome back to A Boring Revolution, your number one news source for everything in regards to The Boring Company. My name is Will and welcome back to part three in our series in regards to feeder tunnels or secondary tunnels as I like to call them. I thought today we could finish up by talking about uh, traditional tunnels and where they will be required in this particular system. So... Part three. So ultimately, there is going to be a small element of traditional tu tunneling involved in every boring company project. However, it will make up a very, very small percentage of all tunnels being constructed. Somewhere around the two to four percent of tunnels will be built using traditional methods. Unfortunately, when you are building short lengths of tunnel, very difficult to bring in machinery specific to that task in a confined work environment, especially if you're working behind a TBM or in a confined um, shaft, for example. So, as we discussed in part two, the feeder tunnel requires a drive shaft and a reception shaft that allow pipe jacking to be completed. So connecting to that drive shaft and that reception shaft will be a short length of traditional tunneling Around 40, maybe up to 50 metres, it'll be pretty short. It'll be run at a gradient. Gradient, anything from a 1 in 9 gradient to a 1 in 15 gradient. It obviously depend on the depth of the arterial tunnel. Let's discuss the final element of our uh, basic series on feeder tunnels. So... Traditional tunneling, yes, slow and methodical. You've got to be very, very careful about building traditional tunnels, especially when you're digging under uh, existing roads, especially when you're digging in areas where you know the ground is not necessarily brilliant. It may be reasonably okay, but if you hit a seam of rock or loose uh, ground, you could be in for a big surprise if that then collapses, delaying your project, costing you thousands and thousands of dollars and also disruption on the surface if it then forms a sinkhole. So obviously, grouting is very, very important when you're doing traditional tunneling and you're going underneath roads. But you've got to be slow and methodical. You've got to be ensuring that your uh, lagging is being installed regularly, that you're using uh, uh, props, in regular increments to ensure that you're shoring up that tunnel and that you're installing your ribs or your uh, arches at regular increments to ensure that, that tunnel is adequately supported. I think it will require a 24-7 workforce, however, possibly maybe not all cases, but you'll have uh, three teams working eight-hour shifts and they'll be working pretty much 24-7 until that short length of tunnel is completed. That will ensure it does not hold up the rest of the project, especially if you uh, have a TBM that is fast approaching and you need to make sure that your connections are completed in advance. Process cannot be 100% mechanised. You can certainly use some kind of machinery in that traditional tunnel. However, it's going to be all hand oper operated. Uh, there's going to be no automation or very, very, very little automation. Uh, there'll be constantly people coming in and coming out of the tunnel. Um, it's, it's a very laborious process if you've ever worked in that particular field. And to ensure the safety of the workers and the people on the surface, and to ensure that existing infrastructure on the surface is not damaged, it needs to be very slow and methodical and probably very much um, a man-based process, low levels of mechanisation. Uh, the, the main reason that we can't use mechanisation, like for the pipe jacking and like using the TBM for the main tunnel, is the gradient. Obviously, we're digging down to meet up with the arterial tunnel. Um, again, it's difficult to find machinery that is going to be fit for purpose for doing that kind of tunnel. It's a relative short length, around 40, maybe up to 50 metres in length. So again, is it really worth bringing in a big piece of machinery that's, say, 10 tonnes in weight just to do 50 metres or 45 metres? It's not, not really. 
not unless you can get a very compact piece of machinery and it, it's not readily available. Um, then again, there is an opportunity here for the Boeing companies to build a specific piece of machinery that is fit for purpose for this particular task. Maybe we'll cover that in, a, net, in a, uh, a further video in the future. Obviously, the cost bringing in machinery to do 45 meters of tunnel and then moving that machinery, it, it just doesn't really make sense. Unless you've got that machinery on site for weeks and weeks and weeks, it's not really worth bringing it in when you can use traditional methods. Okay, so here's our uh, diagram that we showed previously. The area highlighted in purple is where our uh, traditional uh, shaft or uh, sorry, a tunnel, our traditional tunnel is going to be constructed. As you can see, it is at a gradient. The gradient will be determined by the depth of the arterial tunnel, which is this one here in pink with the yellow border. Um, the good thing about having these at separate ends of the excavation is that they can be conducted simultaneously. You can have different crews working those jobs and you could actually build these in advance of the pipe jacking being completed. Therefore, a lot of the work <coughs> can be done simultaneously. If you're building up a program for this particular job, having work done uh, simultaneously shortens the overall program length, which means we can get things done quicker and there are less overheads for this particular project. Um, so, <coughs> here's our drone view. I think it's a bit clear of this drone view. As you can see, we've got our drive shaft and reception shaft. And then connecting to that, we have our, um, our drive shaft ramp and reception shaft ramp. Um, as you can see, it goes, it almost goes through the arterial tunnel. The ideal way to do this would be to build this tunnel, um, possibly in advance up to the border with the arterial tunnel and then at the point where you break through once that TBM has completed its work you would then dig through further. Now why would we do this? Obviously there's going to be another arterial tunnel somewhere here on the other side because they would be running in parallel um, uh, uh, tunnels so if you could have a crossover shaft in between those two tunnels it makes for um, better escape routes you'd have that as an escape route and then obviously you could run up the ramp into let's say this drive shaft here and then you'd have your emergency escape in the corner here that goes up and then round in that shaft and then you could escape to the surface in the event of a fire for example or maybe there was a terrorist attack or there was an accident in the tunnel, you want to be giving people lots of options in terms of being able to escape from the tunnel system. So having a crossover tunnel here in between two arterial tunnels is the best way of doing that. But then you've got your ramp here, which is excellent for people um, escaping from any potential incident or accident. This is from the London Underground. It's just to give you a bit of a picture of what it will look like inside our traditional tunnel. We have our ribs or arches. <coughs> Please note these, these ribs run all the way and underneath the railway track here. They are connected. It's almost like a reverse uh, reverse bow. This is a perfect circle, actually. Um, and that ensures excellent structural integrity. Uh, we have our uh, crossovers here or our noggins that run horizontal to the tunnel. And again, that ensures uh, excellent structural uh, rigidity and will be required at regular increments in our tunnel. Obviously, with it being uh, an earthquake zone, there may need to be more um, noggins or these horizontal members, steel members used than in this particular tunnel. But that is an example of what it will look like. It's just we will have steel lagging, maybe have steel lagging on the inside as well, just to give it a more aesthetic look. Um, as you can see, we have our U-shaped uh, arch here. This would not work because uh, there would be some flexing at the base here. You see the foot plate of this arch. It needs to be connected to the foot plate of the opposite arch. So you'd have uh, a thin steel member 
um, running across here, connecting, ensure that you've got uh, one one entity and that you've not got flexing there in that particular arch. Just like this example here, as you can see, it's like a reverse bow. You have this section under here. In our particular um, tunnel, we would have a, a concrete base which we would pour whilst we were doing our shelves in the particular tunnel. Now they have used multiple um, uh, rock bolts or anchor bolts. It may be possible that we will have to do this uh, in uh, LA if we have some weak ground. However, I imagine most of the time you probably get away with using um, grouting to ensure that the, uh, the actual uh, geology is sound and is not going to be uh, collapsing in on the tunnel, creating any sinkholes above. Uh, again, we've got a piece of equipment here uh, with a telescopic arm. And th it's this kind of equipment that we possibly could use in our tunnel. This is obviously a lot, lot bigger than what we need. Uh, our, if we go back to this, our tunnel will be around, around 11 foot wide, maybe slightly under 11 foot tall, 11 and a half foot, because obviously you've got your your concrete base there. So you're going to have to work out what is going to fit in that tunnel once you've poured that concrete base. Uh, but yeah, if you could build, if you get a piece of equipment like this, uh, you'd still need loaders to remove the excavated material, but something like this could uh, greatly improve the speed of the uh, construction of this uh, tunnel. So what have we learned from this process? If we look at all three episodes in this series, uh, realistically, only 70% of tunnels will be done by proof rock or line storm. We've got all these side tunnels that we need to think about that are going to add a cost to this particular project or projects that we do in the future. Potentially, there is a lot of delays on the surface or potential for delays. Um, what we need to do is ensure that we plan ahead and that we pick spots where it's going to be relatively easy to construct our shafts because potentially we could have eight, nine, maybe even ten shafts being constructed at the same time on any one road. Therefore, we need to plan ahead and ensure that we, we know what we're doing. Any surfaces or utility lines need to be moved in advance, otherwise they will cause us delay. Um, and obviously some roads will maybe possibly need to be... Um, uh, sectioned off with cones, uh, narrowed, or even closed off in certain circumstances. So there needs to be a good uh, planning in that respect. Uh, we need reliable systems and equipment. The Boeing Company, like I keep saying, it should be its own contractor, should be using the same subcontractors where possible, should be consistently improving its systems or its technology for building these feeder tunnels to ensure that in the future they have the most efficient um, most lean, effective solution to digging short sections of tunnel. Will be more cost effective to space out feeder tunnels. Now I've kind of done, gone full circle on this because originally I was saying that we should have feeder tunnels maybe every uh, mile or so, but why not have them every 1.6 miles or two miles and then do a longer feeder tunnel? Uh, be a lot more cost effective, especially with the pipe jacking. So you could have a feeder tunnel that was 800 meters long, potentially. Maybe 600 meters long is, is maybe a more ideal length. But it all needs to be looked at when they are costing a job. I certainly think it's better to have longer feeder tunnels, but fewer feeder tunnels. Uh, grouting. Grouting is absolutely critical. Um, and I've worked on jobs where the ground is very, very poor and there's extensive grouting is required and, it, and it's very, very effective at showing up that ground uh, and showing that there's, it almost glues the ground together and that's what we will need if we're going to do a short length of traditional tunnelling. What we don't want is any surface movement. We don't want cracks appearing in the road above. We get complaints from people, then they have to close the road off and then we end up having to pay hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, rectify the issues. And um, the best way to do that is to use more grout than you'll actually need. And therefore, the probability that it will get surface movement will be fairly low. So thank you. Thank you for watching our three-part series. Um, 
I'm going to go back to what we've been doing tr uh, traditionally for this channel. Uh, I'm going to be looking at some projects and some news in the next week or so. Please like and subscribe, guys. It really helps grow this channel. The more people watching this channel uh, accelerates its growth. And obviously, we, we, we've got a bigger say in this community if we have more people subscribing to this channel. And please contribute to the uh, comments section below. That would be awesome. Uh, I'd like to see all your comments, any suggestions you have. Any idea of machinery that you could use on this traditional methods, please let me know. Thank you for watching, guys. Really, really appreciate your time watching this episode. And just remember, guys, do not be boring. Hopefully, I'll see you soon. Goodbye. Have a great day.